Okay, we got a full new show for you today. First up, we're going to cover App Annie and the fraud where they were ordered to pay 10 million and their founder is now unable to be on a public board or be an officer at a public company for three years. Quite a speeding ticket there. And then we're going to cover Instagram's detrimental effect on teenage girls and how they've disclosed none of this to the public and they got caught with their hand in the cookie jar. I've got some choice words for Zuckerberg and Facebook. Finally, we cover Discord raising at a $15 billion valuation. We do a little analysis head to head with Reddit. I think the two companies should merge. I'll explain why before they go public. And finally, a deep dive into MailChimp selling for $12 billion to Intuit. And should the employees have taken stock or should they have taken those guaranteed bonuses? We'll talk about the difference between the two types of companies, ones that give stock options and one that give generous salary and bonus. Stick with us. This Week in Startups is brought to you by... Fiverr Business is a modern workplace for the digital world. Their team of dedicated business success managers help match you with the best freelancers for your team. Right now, you can sign up for Fiverr Business free for the first year and save 10% on your purchase with promo code JASON. That's F-I-V-E-R-R dot com slash business and use promo code JASON. Squarespace, turn your idea into a new website. Go to squarespace.com slash twist for a free trial. When you're ready to launch, use offer code twist to save 10% of your first purchase of a website or domain. And Embroker's startup insurance program helps startups secure the most important types of insurance at a lower cost and with less hassle. Save up to 20% off traditional insurance today at embroker.com slash twist. While you're there, get an extra 10% off using offer code TWIST. Okay, in our first story, the fraud parade continues. Man, whenever a market gets hot, like we see in crypto and in startups and the public markets, when things get overheated and the government's giving away a bunch of free money, then you start to see a lot of corruption and you see a lot of fraud. Uh, today's fraud is uh, the SEC has charged mobile data seller app Annie and their former CEO with securities fraud, and the company will pay a $10 million settlement. Okay, so here from the press release on Tuesday, the SEC announced they were charging App Annie and former CEO co-founder Bertrand Schmidt with securities fraud, uh, and they would be forced to pay $10 million in a settlement. Uh, if you don't know about App Annie, they help companies basically optimize uh, their mobile app performance. So you can do things like increase your downloads or maybe move up in the App Store rankings. You give them data, they give you back analytics about your product. And then the concept is they were supposed to be taking all of that data from all of the 8 million apps they claim use the service, uh, like downloads and usage statistics, how many people open it, all that stuff, uh, revenue estimates. And then they would sell that data in an anonymized fashion uh, to traders looking to place bets on this data. So people who do, you know, major, major trades, of course, buy data from many different sources. You may have heard of this before, where satellite companies were taking pictures of parking lots and giving the parking lot data or maybe port data, how many ships were coming into a port to as a proxy for economic activity, whether it's at a target or a city or a country. And so then you can place a bet on that, which means, you know, any information you can publicly get, that's not insider trading, right? Not exactly. It's just you getting an edge through information. And there's a fine line between what's insider and what's just really clever data to get you could sit outside of a Tesla dealership, count the number of people going in and out, and do that every day. Or if you happen to be across the street from a Tesla dealership, uh, or a Starbucks, what if you put a camera there, and you literally counted the number of people coming in and out or built software to do that, and then made trades based on it seems like a logical thing to do. If you see the number of people coming to a Starbucks every day increase, you know, you might want to increase your bet, just like counting cards isn't technically illegal in blackjack. If you know there are more face cards in the deck, you can make a strategy on that. But of course, the casino can kick you out. In this case, the casino is the SEC, and they'll look at the rules. So App Annie, uh, not sure exactly what the company's valued at right now, but we found a, a, val a last investment of $63 million out of $500 or so million dollar valuation in their Series E. But here's what went wrong according to the SEC press release. App Annie and Schmidt understood that companies would only share their confidential app performance data with App Annie if it promised not to disclose their data to third parties. Okay, so if you were running your app and you were Uber or Twitter 
or some nascent company, your com or headspace, whatever it happens to be, you were using app any to optimize yours, you would not want third parties to have your data. Uh, as a result, app any promised their customers that the confidential data would be anonymized and aggregated before being sold to trading firms, according to the SEC release. What does that mean? Okay, we took all the games and we said, these are the number of hours being played on games on iPhones versus Android phones. Here's the number of on demand companies or ride sharing companies. But they thought they were all being anonymized. Obviously, they weren't. Uh, so contrary to these representations, the order finds that from late 2014 through mid 2018, App Annie used non aggregated and non anonymized data to alter its model generated estimates to make them more valuable to trading firms. According to the Reese, App Annie knew that their customers were making investment decisions based on their estimates, and they even shared strategies on how the firms could use the estimates to trade ahead of quarterly earnings, according to the SEC release. So um, here's a quote from the director of SEC's enforcement division here app Annie and Schmidt lied to companies about how their confidential data was being used. And then not only sold the manipulated estimates to the trading firm customers, but also encouraged them to trade on those estimates, often touting how closely they correlated with the company's true performance and stock price. In other words, Schmidt was out there telling people, use my data, buy my data, you're going to make more money trading stocks. Is that insider trading? No, it's not information from the company. Um, but in a way, it's sort of like a secondary level of insider trading. It's kind of hard to describe, right? Uh, because people gave that data, but they gave it under the auspices of it being anonymized. So, you know, do you do insiders have an advantage? Of course they do. Of course they do. Anytime you have a lot of money at stake and in some kind of gambling or trading environment, people will try to get an edge. And some people actually take pride in getting an edge that is illegal or not available, you know, depending on if you want to be charitable uh, or if you want to be super cynical about it. In terms of fraud, you know, this is serious fraud. It, is it fraud on the level of Theranos where the service doesn't work uh, and you're basically putting people's lives at risk? No. Um, you know, 10 is Bernie Madoff and Theranos in my mind, like premeditated fraud. Um, I put this, you know, in the six, seven, eight range, it's just somebody doing something super unethical, and they got busted. And there's no indication here if that person has been banned. Uh, but usually there's a ban with these things like they would be Oh, no, actually, there is a ban. App Annie and Schmidt did not admit or deny the findings, but App Annie will pay 10 million Schmidt will pay 300 K and Schmidt will be prohibited from serving as a director or officer of a public company for three years. So I would say that's a speeding ticket more than uh, a, a real uh, serious action. It's a speeding ticket. Uh, you know, I don't know if it's a slap on the wrist, a slap on the wrist would be don't do it again. Um, I would categorize this as you know, a speeding ticket, which if you own a Ferrari, and you get like a serious speeding ticket, and you get your license suspended for three years, that's kind of painful, right? If you if they impound the car, this is kind of like you're a Ferrari, you're doing 150 on the streets, they impound the car, you lose your license for three years. So it's a serious speeding ticket serious action. And as I said, uh, on CNBC the other day, and I think I said it on this week in startups, there's 800 unicorns. Now, in my estimate, one out of 100 companies I invest in, or, you know, I uh, meet with sometimes, you know, well, I'd say out of the companies I've invested in 300. I've seen in 1% of the cases, things that would be very concerning to me, maybe not made off their nose level frauds, but people doing things that I've had to tell them like, uh, that's not a good idea. <laughs> If you are telling people these are our customers on a slide, let's say, and half of them are your customers and half of them are in your pipeline, you may be exaggerating, but exaggerating when you're selling securities, securities fraud, um, you know, giving people data to trade on now you're getting into securities fraud. So you have to just have a very high moral and ethical uh, compass when you are running a company. I've seen people do things they think are no big deal, like I'm not going to take a salary. But I'm gonna have the company pay for my apartment. And I'm gonna have a corporate card that I put all my living expenses on, like, then you're doing tax evasion. Why is it tax evasion? Because if you were supposed to get a salary, you're supposed to pay income tax. And if you're living and sleeping in your apartment, and you use one third of it as an office and two thirds for living, well, then you should really be doing one third uh, as an expense against your personal taxes, or maybe the company pays for it. I and mean, you just have to talk to a tax accountant and make sure you do these things right. Uh, so when you see all of these Tiger Globals and other companies, allegedly, uh, I, you know, I haven't seen this firsthand, but people have been talking about this, 
uh, these firms basically taking a leap of faith and saying, we're going to not do diligence, or we're going to do light diligence, and we're going to pay a high price so we can close a deal quicker. That means that they're relying on the early investors to make sure that everything is audited and tight. My Lord, I can tell you now in this frothy market, the last six months, when I ask founders who are considering investing and in to give me their document locker and to due diligence, we get pushback, I'd say 25% of the time when we ask for a bank statement, or we ask for incorporation docs, or we ask to see contracts, and they're like, other investors haven't asked for that. And when somebody says to me, other investors haven't asked for that, all of a sudden, it's like, boop, boop. It's just like the alarms go off. Okay, other investors didn't ask for it. And they're putting in more money than me, they're leading the round and didn't ask to see the contracts. You know, I've had many times and I, I told a story in my book, Angel, where somebody told me they had Google and Facebook as customers. And then in diligence, we asked to see the contracts. And they said, Oh, it was an oral agreement. And then I said, Okay, who's the oral agreement with? And they said, Oh, well, you know, we met these two people at a party, we pitched them our product, they said they would totally do it. and We're meeting with them. But they told me they were their pilot customers. I mean, oof, and that I'm supposed to buy securities. And then I saw that same company on one of those Fugazi uh, equity crowdfunding sites, not the legit ones, I think Republic and seed investor are, are super legit, they have a diligence process. I know companies of mine that have gone through it. And you know, I've got firsthand experience there that they have a pretty rigorous process. Uh, that doesn't mean everything's going to win. But it means, you know, they should eliminate frauds from getting to the system. But this thing I saw was a total fraud. And then I saw them on like one of the second tier equity crowdfunding sites. So buyer beware. If you're playing in a poker game, my best advice to you is to assume somebody's rigging the game and try to defend yourself. And this correlates with what we saw yesterday with NFTs. Somebody came at me on Twitter and said, Hey, you know, you're you're beating up on crypto too much. Well, here we go. Today is a totally non crypto fraud. And for the last couple of weeks, we've been covering Theranos, we cover Tether, we cover Theranos, and we'll cover App Annie, we'll cover fraud wherever it is, we'll do it on OpenSea, which is a, you know, venture backed crypto company but yesterday, fraud exists, when you're gambling, when you're investing, assume that somebody could be trying to screw you and just act accordingly, right? And, and take precautions doesn't mean you shouldn't place bets, but you got to be careful. When you're trying to keep the momentum going on an important project, you may need some extra help. Well, Fiverr Business puts a world of expert freelancers at your fingertips so you can get that project across the finish line and be proud of the work. Plus, you'll get everything you need to seamlessly integrate your new team members into your workflow. We love Fiverr here at launch, and we've hired a bunch of researchers and marketers over the years to help us finish some important projects. One of them we did, we um, needed to let everybody know in Australia that we're coming with launch festival. Boom, I hit the ground running. Now, they have Fiverr for business, they created Fiverr for business for folks like us running companies who need to have a VIP concierge level of service and their team of dedicated business success managers, BSMs are going to help you find the great talent to join your team. There are no more endless guessing and interviews, plus save and share your favorite freelancers for future projects. Find the freelancers you need to give your next project just the boost it needs to finish strong. Right now, you can sign up for Fiverr for Business absolutely free for the first year, one year free, and save 10% on your purchase on Fiverr Business with the promo code Jason. Just go to fiverr.com slash business, and don't forget that promo code Jason. Fiverr is spelled F-I-V-E-R-R dot com, okay? Fiverr.com slash business, promo code Jason. Let's get back to this epic episode. According to a Wall Street Journal report, Facebook executives know that Instagram is toxic for teen girls and have downplayed significant mental health issues. My Lord, you know, we, we all know this just based on firsthand experience, but using Instagram and the influence it has over young people and even old people to create FOMO or body image issues is obvious to anyone. Media is extremely powerful. And it has an incredibly detrimental effect on your mental health. It is, you know, to me, a crisis that I would put similar to say cigarettes, cigarettes, you know, were chemicals in your lungs that killed you from cancer. Uh, anybody who looks at what happens when somebody gets cancer, and then looks at what happens when people have mental health issues like depression, which one is worse? I'm curious in your mind, which is worse? I'm looking at the people in the live chat room. I'm wondering, if somebody had severe depression, or they had lung cancer when they were 70, but they had severe depression from when they were 
20 years old to 60 years old, which would be a worse fate to be severely depressed and anxious from 20 to 60, or to just die of, uh, you know, lung cancer at 70, right? We really should start thinking about it in those terms, in my mind, that's how I look at it. So according to the Wall Street Journal, Facebook conducted in depth research on the impacts of Instagram on children's mental health from 2018 to 2020, but they never made the research public. And this is where journalism is super important. Journalists, uh, you know, really need to sink their teeth into this kind of stuff because you do have bad actors like Instagram and Facebook out there. Nor did they make this research available to academics or lawmakers who previously asked for it. So in other words, this is the cover up. If you've ever seen the movie The Insider, uh, I think that's a Michael Mann movie uh, with Russell Crowe, one of my top 10 favorite films. It's very similar to what happened with the tobacco companies. They had the research. They knew it. and they hit it from people. And, and that really is horrific. In my mind, teens, children should not use social media. Uh, I'm keeping my kids off it for as long as possible. TikTok seems the absolute worst Instagram right behind it. And uh, I covered Facebook uh, talking about building Instagram for kids, uh, which I called the worst idea ever uh, on episode 1213 in May. Think about it for a second. The people at Facebook, who have children and unlimited resources to raise those children get reports back in in-depth research that they are causing mental health problems in children. Not only do they not share that with other academics, not only do they try to slow things down and have an open discussion with public policy people. No. What does Facebook do? They recommend Instagram for kids. Are you kidding me? Really? You know this is going down, Zuckerberg, and you have kids? Really? And then you decide you're going to do Instagram for kids. So you know that teens and people over the age of 13, 16 are having mental health issues. And you decide, let's go earlier with the mental health issues. Do you realize how deranged that is? Facebook presentation slides from 2019 stated, quote, we make body image issues worse for one in three teen girls. Teens blame Instagram for increases in the rate of anxiety and depression. The reaction was unprompted and consistent across all groups, according to the Wall Street Journal. Oh, my Lord. Can you imagine being a Facebook executive, being in a meeting, and somebody pulls up a slide that says, we make body image issues worse for one in three teen girls. And teens blame Instagram for increases in the rate of anxiety and depression. The teens are telling you you're doing this to them. And you're doing it to one out of three girls. This isn't one in 10. It's not one in 20. Maybe you say it's a statistical anomaly. Maybe the data is wrong. If they're telling you you're doing this to them, believe them. Teenagers are telling you they're ruining, you're ruining their lives with your product. Believe them. Come up with ways to maybe uh not allow certain types of images or to uh maybe throttle people going uh, viral on these services there are things you could be doing and at the very least you could be putting warnings up telling parents and maybe increasing the age at which people start on this but that is against zuckerberg's key key mission zuckerberg only cares about growth i've been saying this for you know, over 10 years now i know the guy i've met him i know the people who work for him he has only ever cared about one thing, growth. One thing matters to Zuckerberg, growth. And he is not, you know, the most social of people. I don't want to uh, diagnose him from afar, but, you know, when Saturday Night Live does skits about him being Asperger's-esque uh, and everybody kind of says, this person does not understand social dynamics, you have somebody who maybe is not very sophisticated in social dynamics. I'll say it in a charitable way based on his behavior, not trying to diagnose him. Um, and if that person is in charge of the world's largest social experiment, what do we think is going to happen? What decisions do you think he's going to ma be made? He's gotten the largest fines in the history of the FTC. And that's all you need to know. You cannot trust Zuck. Don't trust Zuck. And you do not want these products in your life. According to the Wall Street Journal article, about 22 million teens log into Instagram every day. Uh, they should be banned from doing so. I, I think it's that simple. I think they should just increase the age. Maybe it's like 17 years old. Um, if we assume 11 million of those are young women or girls, just cut the number in half. Um, if one in three of those 11 million are facing body image issues, that's 3.6 million teen girls every day experiencing body issues. I mean, it's just gross, right? 
It's super gross. How dare you? How can you live with yourself, Mark Zuckerberg? I mean, just horrific. A Virginia Congresswoman Jennifer Wexton gave her thoughts on the matter. We make body images issue. We make body image issues worse for one in three teen girls. She did the quote that I just read. This report is sickening. It's hard enough being a teen girl these days. Facebook must get a lot more transparent about how it serves content and the impact of that content, especially on young women. Uh, the Wall Street Journal also notes that in public, Facebook has downplayed Instagram's ne negative effects on teens' mental health. That's like trusting the cigarette companies who had doctors in their ads and told you it was good for circulation. I mean, really, you're going to trust Mark Zuckerberg or Facebook executives when they're suppressing data and they've made every decision possible to increase the share price by increasing engagement, even if it screws up democracy, elections, and now teens' mental health. I mean, you can make a list of the things that social media is having a negative impact on democracy, mental health. I mean, how much more evidence do we need to know that this is not a positive for society and it needs to be rethought of? Uh, and, and of course, consumers are responsible because they're be the ones being addicted to this. This is, you know, we might look back on this era and say fentanyl killed X number of people and depression from social media anxiety caused this much suffering and suicides, right? We might actually look at that. Um, and, uh, you know, it might be neck and neck, right? Drug overdoses uh, and mental health. And maybe they're overlapping. Maybe people get depressed from social media, from being on Facebook or Instagram, and then they self-medicate with opioids or fentanyl, right? It's quite possible. So uh, the quote from Zuckerberg from March of 2021, the research that we've seen is that using social apps to connect with other people can have positive mental health benefits. Oh, my Lord. You know, this is just shows you how horrible human being Zuckerberg is. The way that sentence is phrased is so weaselly and practiced. The research we've seen, right, is qualifying it, is that using social apps to connect with other people can, not does, can have positive mental health benefits. So he basically doesn't talk about kids using the apps or this depression stuff. He leaves that out of it. And then he probably has some report that some number of people had a positive experience, right? Sure, some people can have a positive experience doing something dangerous, of course. Uh, so Adam uh, Mosari, the head of Instagram, told reporters in May that research indicated that apps effects on teens well being likely quite small, according to the Wall Street Journal. You know, uh, Mar Hicks is a tech professor, and she commented to the Wall Street Journal article, companies love to pretend they don't realize the harms their products cause. They always know. Yes, always. <laughs> so should these type of reports be public going forward for all social media companies? Yeah, I think social media companies are having an existential uh, crisis now. And I think their very existence is causing so much damage to democracy, um, to social discourse and mental health, that society will, over time, um, you know, recontextualize how they operate. And, uh, you know, China is telling people, listen, you cannot be on these services in some cases. And um, we're going to limit video game usage. They're looking at this. And then other countries obviously banning Facebook, especially during elections. Other countries who are authoritarian are seeing the negative impact. And because they're authoritarian, they take immediate action. So sometimes when you see an authoritarian country take immediate action, it's because they can. Um, we in a democracy are going to have to have a dialogue about this. Well, the dialogue is pretty clear now. Uh, we know these companies have been causing damage. Uh, for well over a decade now. It's so obvious to everybody. Um, and it's so obvious that all they care about is growth and it's growth at all costs, whether it's YouTube with their algorithm or Facebook with theirs. This will only stop when the algorithm stops serving us the information and, you know, we set some age limits. I mean, those are the two things that have to occur. So Facebook, Facebook executives, you should be ashamed of yourselves. And I hope the money was worth it. But you're going to regret it on your deathbeds. The end. Was that a little too rough? Chat room. <laughs> Sorry. You'll regret it on your deathbeds. A little too dramatic. From websites and online stores to marketing tools and analytics, Squarespace is the all-in-one platform to build a beautiful online presence and run your business. With Squarespace, you know you can blog and publish content, you can promote your business, you can announce upcoming events or special projects, and you can sell products and services of all kinds and more. 
No matter what the problem, Squarespace is the answer. They have beautiful templates by world-class designers. That's kind of where they got started and everybody noticed it. Whoa, look at these beautiful uh, designs. But they've added so much functionality since that time, including powerful e-commerce functionality. And everything is optimized for mobile right out of the box. It's got built-in SEO, free and secure hosting, and of course, their 24-7 award-winning customer support. Back in 2020, we decided we'd create RemoteDemoDay.com for founders to pitch thousands of angel investors over Zoom. Well, we purchased the domain name RemoteDemoDay.com and had the site up and running within minutes. From idea to execution in just minutes and incredible functionality so you can grow with them. And it's been a huge success for us so far. I mean, we've invested tens of millions of dollars. I kid you not. So go to squarespace.com slash twist for a free trial. And when you're ready to launch, use offer code twist to save 10% off your first purchase of a website or domain. And congratulations to the team for going public on May 19th. What an amazing journey. It's been amazing to watch Squarespace grow and become such a vibrant company. And congratulations on that milestone. Discord is now valued at $15 billion after raising $500 million. Uh, this was led by Dragoneer, KOTU, Fidelity, and others, the folks who tend to invest in late-stage startups before they go public. If you remember uh, back on episode 1190, Microsoft was very close to acquiring Discord uh, for a rumored price between 10 and $12 billion. Those talks fell through. Uh, so, obviously, if at this valuation... Uh, they are now valued at, you know, somewhere between 20 and 50% more than they uh, would have been valued in that deal with Microsoft. If you don't know Discord, it's a chat room. It's a chat room. It's like AOL chat. It's like, you know, Yammer turned into Slack or AOL chat, Yahoo chat <laughs> turned into Yammer, turned into Slack, turned into Discord. So, um, and it's, but it's more for content that's on Reddit. In other words, content that young people, whether it's video games or, comic books or music would be into. So let's break down Discord's numbers uh, for their chat service. And we'll compare them to Reddit, which is I think these are very complementary brands that are both going to wind up going public. I think they, the two should merge and go public, they would be worth 100 billion together. That's the best idea uh, that anybody's going to say in the next 24 hours on the internet. So somebody bookmark that uh, Discord was launched in May of 2015. Reddit was launched 10 years earlier in 2005. So uh, on a valuation basis, Discord is at 15 billion, Reddit's over 10 billion, um, and Reddit raised uh, a $700 million Series F in uh, this past August, last month. That means they're about to go public, uh, if you're wondering. That's just a lot of money. Those late-stage investors are looking to double their money in two years or something like that, maybe triple it in two or three years. So they're making a late-stage bet that they want to, you know, they take a lot of risk before it goes public and gets priced by the public markets. Fidelity is in both their rounds. There are no fools. They they know that these services are not going anywhere. Reddit did not give an exact valuation, just over $10 billion, uh, But we can assume uh, Discord's valuation is a little bit higher. So on a revenue basis, uh, according to the Wall Street Journal uh, and some of the numbers we found, uh, Discord had $130 million in revenue in 2020, which was 3x in 2019. So tripling a big number like $45 million is pretty impressive. It's hard to double big numbers or triple them. A high growth stock in the public markets would be over 20% year over year growth. So in the private markets, we are really looking for companies that triple, 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 double, 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 something like that. Sometimes you can get a triple, 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 double, double, double. Uh, sometimes in the early stages, you'll see a company go four or five X year over year. So that's how these private uh, companies kind of grow, which means in 2021, with the pandemic and people at home and discord getting super popular, who knows, maybe they tripled again. Maybe their revenue is 300 million now. We don't know. Reddit did between 170 and 200 million in revenue in 2020 based on the numbers we found online. Again, private companies uh, do not need to give out their numbers, but sometimes they get leaked by investors or somebody might give an estimate. Uh, they had uh, confirmed 100 million in advertising in Q2 of 2021. So they're on a $400 million run rate. That was according to the Series F announcement. So based on my estimates, if they two and a half times their revenue, uh, that means Discord would be at 130, 260, plus another, call it 60 or 70. You know, you're you're looking at 350 million in revenue. Let's take a guess. Uh, and <laughs> Reddit at 400 million. Pretty amazing that they're both in the same exact zone. Discord sells a hundred dollar a year premium subscription called Nitro for servers. Uh, and when you purchase those, 
it makes your servers have more advanced features and tools. Slack calls their servers or their instances workspaces. Reddit, as you know, has subreddits. You can think of those as forums. If you have Nitro, you can do, you know, a lot of extra little things like personal profiles and HD video screen sharing and file uploads or larger file uploads. Discord currently has over 150 million monthly active users, according to Bloomberg. Reddit said it had 430 million monthly active users at the end of 2019. Now, Reddit has been around a long time. And as you know, when you've been around that extra 10 years, that's why they have that big boost because they get SEO traffic. You type anything in these days, you're highly likely to have Quora and Reddit come up. Reddit is kind of like Quora, the Q&A site, because anytime you type in a question, what you'll see in Google autofill, if you say, uh, what's a movie like Tropic Thunder, you'll see at the end Reddit. So people now are adding the word Reddit, they're appending the word Reddit, fancy word for adding, at the end of a Google search. That's when you know you've got a baller service, is when people say, give me the answer of Reddit. In terms of servers and subreddits, 6.7 million active servers on uh, Discord in 2020, according to the business of apps. If 20% of those servers are paying 100 bucks a year, that's about 1.3 million customers at 130 million in revenue, which was their revenue in 2020. 20% seems high to me, but I, I might go with 10 or 5%. Uh, 3 million total subreddits, according to uh, Reddit's metrics page. Um, you know, which one of these is the better service? Which one would I rather own? Well, Reddit's been around longer. Reddit can add Discord, just like Reddit added images and got rid of Imgur, I think was the service that was doing images. Uh, if they were both publicly traded, and I could only own one, that would be a very hard decision to make. I might go with Reddit because of longevity. But if I wanted quicker returns in a shorter period of time, I go with Discord. So I think Reddit, more stable, never going anywhere. And one of the great lessons of Reddit is that if you just keep running a service that has product market fit, it will not go away. <laughs> Reddit has never had a competitor. Discord on the margins is competitive, but it's not going to get rid of Reddit. And if Dig had just stuck around and the venture capitalists had not pushed Kevin Rose to try to reinvent the service, it would still be running and it still would be awesome. Okay, congratulations to Discord. If you don't have business insurance, you failed one of the first steps of being an entrepreneur. Startups should look no further than in broker. And Brokers Technology saves you time and money. Their prices are up to 20% lower with better coverage than the incumbents. And you can go from sign up to quote and purchase in just 10 minutes. So when you work with a broker instead of business insurance incumbents, you're not dealing with large, slow corporations. And the sign up takes days, not weeks. The process is transparent with no opaque pricing. So let's talk about two very crucial types of startup insurance. You'll know that these are very much in the news, especially the first one, cyber insurance. You have to have cyber insurance, which covers tax, and they happen more than you think. A lot of them you don't hear about publicly, right? Because people are uh, ashamed to have them happen and they should have done a better job, but mistakes happen. And sometimes software is imperfect, right? Or a human is imperfect and they make a mistake. They use a weak password. They forget to put two factor on. Well, you want to have cyber insurance just in case that happens. Plus DNO insurance. This helps if your directors and officers do something dumb and you get sued. Very simple, very important to have cyber and DNO. So to instantly buy custom built insurance for startups, go to imbroker.com slash twist, E M B R O K E R.com slash twist. While you're there, you're going to get an extra 10% off by using the offer code twist, T W I S T. Okay, let's get back to this amazing episode. Okay, congratulations to our friends at MailChimp. What an amazing company. We've used the product, an amazing product. They were one of the first sponsors of this week in startups over. 10 years ago. What a great company. What a great founding team. And one of you, uh, Colin DeVore, um, asked me, or De Devro, Colin Devro asked me uh, to comment on it. And uh, there's a lot of notable things about MailChimp. Now, they've been uh, acquired for $12 billion in cash and stock. And MailChimp will likely be used to beef up into its QuickBooks offering by adding email marketing features. QuickBooks, you know, is a suite of accounting software targeted at startups and SMBs. SMBs, small, medium-sized businesses, and they have over 7 million customers worldwide. Intuit stock rose 2% on the news Monday afternoon, and Intuit currently has a $156 billion market cap. They own a suite of products uh, that includes TurboTax and Credit Karma in addition to QuickBooks. And they did almost 10 billion in revenue in 2021, and they're growing 25% year over year. 
And that's impressive uh, for a company that's been around since 1983. The MailChimp acquisition uh, would also be the largest acquisition of a bootstrap startup ever. Uh, what's a bootstrap startup? One that does not raise venture capital. When I started using MailChimp, I meet and I became an angel investor. I immediately asked Ben, "Can I raise money?" He said, "No, we're not uh, raising money." I said, "Oh, well, if you ever do, let me know." He says, "We're never going to." He was absolutely clear from the beginning they would never raise money, uh, and it's a hundred percent founder owned and incredibly profitable that company. And they would give their employees huge bonuses every year. I think somewhere, you know, the, what I heard from employees was you know, 15 to 25% a year cash bonuses to a group of employees who were very well paid. So um, other major exits of uh, bootstrapped companies, you may remember Minecraft getting bought uh, for 2.5 billion assurance IQ got bought for 2.4 billion. According to the New York Times, MailChimp has uh, 13 million total global users and 800,000 paid customers, half of which are outside the US. One of the notable things about MailChimp was they were one of the first companies in the web 2.0 phase to have personality, to have a character attached to them. And back in the 2000s, that was all the rage. You know, Reddit had their little alien and everybody had to have, you know, some uh, some little character associated with their brand MailChimp, obviously. <laughs> I used to do these MailChimp ads where I go, <laughs> MailChimp. <laughs> their revenue, uh, according to Forbes, hit 800 million last year. That means they sold uh, for 15 times right 10 times it would be 800 million would be 8 billion and so then another 4 billion 12 billion uh 15 times you know their uh top line it's pretty juicy uh and if they were let's just say they had a 25 percent margin uh that would be 250 million that means whatever number that is 50 times uh the founders, um, obviously, as I mentioned, were doing this, you know, uh, profit sharing model instead of stock based compensation that reduced all the risk for all employees. So a lot of people are dunking on them. Oh, my God, why didn't they have uh, stock options, etc? Well, because the founders believed they would be able to attract talent by paying top top salaries and giving huge bonuses and great benefits. And all those employees took that deal. In other words, instead of making, you know, 200 to a million dollars, when the company uh, was sold after working there for 15 years, you know, they received $25,000 a year or $50,000 a year guaranteed. And so uh, that is um, capitalism at its finest, those people could have gone to Google or Facebook and made more money, or they could have gone to a failed company on stock options, which became worth nothing. They chose the middle road. I'd like to see more companies pursue this. And I'd like to see more uh, bootstrap companies um, who don't raise venture capital or maybe raise one round to become a Pegasus, uh, like some companies that we've had. You remember uh, Jason Fried, friend of the pod, uh, great guest on the pod from 37 uh, signals had a, a controversial tweet on ownership and stock options back in February of 2020. I'll quote Jason Fried, giving out equity in startups benefits ownership way more than employees, it allows the owners to push employees harder and harder, because quote, you've got skin in the game. Now you're an owner. No, you aren't owning less than 1% of anything is an ownership. A uh, true and not true. I can tell you that owning 10 basis points or 25 basis points or 50 basis points in a unicorn, or one that becomes, you know, worth uh, a decacorn or 100 billion a centurion, uh, that can be a lot. And Paul Graham, uh, and I had some fun in the replies of his tweet. Uh, Yahoo gave me a lot of options when this is Paul Graham, Yahoo gave me a lot of options when they bought our company, I made so much money from them that Yahoo got less work out of me, I quit after a year leaving a huge amount of money on the table because I felt I already had enough. Um, and I <laughs> wrote, I heard from a friend that a fraction of 1% of Uber was worth a lot of money. That's obviously I owned a fraction of 1% of Uber. Aside uh, from all of this, MailChimp was not 100% remote before the pandemic, but now offers four different uh, variants, uh, shouldn't use the term variants, variations of employees, uh, they could be 100% remote no set desk, two days in the office, no set desk, three days in the office, dedicated desk or fully in the office, dedicated desk. 76% of the staff chose to come to the office two days a week or less. So uh, that's a really interesting aside. Congratulations to the team to the people who are haters who are dunking on them. You know, like, you're just in the crowd in the Coliseum, like eat your bread and enjoy the circus. You're not even in the game. Nobody cares about your opinion. Additionally, uh, I will say what a savvy move by MailChimp. 
Uh, you may have noticed uh, companies like Review bought by Twitter and a company called uh, Substack offer, I believe, completely free email. And I don't know if there's any limit on the number of emails they'll send for you. They want to make money if you charge and they take whatever 10 or 20% of whatever you charge for your subscriptions. That's the way the world's moving. I believe email sending will become a commodity. So MailChimp did have some headwinds. I don't think it would have, you know, made MailChimp fall apart. But I was looking at it and saying, you know what, maybe I'll take some of my MailChimp list down, move them to review because now if you go to twitter.com slash Jason, you can sign up for my review. So if my MailChimp is built into Twitter, and I'm a Twitter user, and I'm active there, I'm thinking about doing that. In fact, can somebody on the team take Jason's list, my personal list and just put it in review and let's just or let's have a conversation about that at the next staff meeting. Congratulations to the MailChimp team. I'll take a couple of questions. Uh, Rachel, on a scale of one to 10, how manipulated was crypto today? I think crypto is uh, at least 50% manipulated, um, at least maybe as much as 80%. What do I mean by manipulation? I think there are people who are creating fake trades um, and pushing um, activity in order to get other people to join in. So as an example, take the board ape, uh, you know, yacht club, what if we were the first, you know, you and five of the people listening here, we each owned 100 of these. What if we created a bunch of wallets, and we started trading them back and forth with each other? And we increased the price 5% each time. And we did that over 20 days. And they went from being worth 9,000 to 175,000. Oh, wait, that's exactly what's just happened. We don't know if people are doing this kind of uh, painting of the tape or flooding the market with transactions to trick new people that this is a vibrant market and to get them excited. But that could be what's going on. You see this uh, acutely in three card Monty. If you've ever been to New York, and when I was in New York, I was fascinated with this and I would watch it over and over again first from afar, and then from like a short distance, and then right up front and never played, they would have three cards, and they would move them around and you'd have to guess which one was the queen. Uh, and you'd have confederates, people who were in on it, who were betting. So you'd see two or three people betting. And then you'd walk up and you'd see them win, you know, they bet 20, they win 40, they bet 40, they win 80. And they would be winning and they win two or 300 bucks, then you would get in there and you'd win. And then you'd win again. And then you'd bet again, and you'll lose. Uh, and then you put more money out and you lose and then they would take all that money off you. It turns out they were putting these confederates around you to make you think that there was a lot going on here. Obviously, like NFTs are not worth what they're worth. There's no intrinsic value there. So the only value is in what the velocity of the trading is and what people put on it. Well, since you don't know who's doing all these trades and you don't know if there's a whole group of people manipulating the market, you're probably that sucker walking up to three card Monty. That doesn't mean that somebody can't win once at three card Monty and walk away. That doesn't mean you can't get in on it and be one of the confederates and get paid by the person and start your own three card Monty scam. So I think it's a giant scam uh, 60, 70, 80% of the time. And I think that there'll be a lot of people who could get hurt by it. There's another group of people who believe that this is like manifest destiny. If enough people buy into Bitcoin, if enough people buy into board apes, then it creates the market. And then, you know, it's never going to go away, yada, yada. I am not one of those people. If you are buying into this, and you've made a ton of money, I suggest you clear out 25% of your position 50% of your position, just to have that idiot insurance. Unless you're a complete gambler who likes to have 90% of their wealth in one thing. Okay, last question. How would you go about starting your career over if you're 25 today? Oh, my Lord, what a great question. Well, I had access to invest in a lot of companies. And for the first I don't know, from when I was 25 until I was 40, I wasn't investing in my friends companies, I should have just done that. I would be really rich if I had done that. And so investing in your friends and placing more bets is what I would have done. I would have been more risk taking. But you know, when I started in my career, I was very conservative. And you know, I, I didn't want to take as much risk and I should have taken more risk and been more bold. So that is my piece of advice to my former self. Okay, uh, so I'm going to take another question here. Um, Sex Pistols handle on YouTube asks, how do you decide if a co founder is right for you? What about asking friends to be co founders? Okay, uh, your friends are probably your best co founders, because you have a, a great relationship with them. And you just have to make everything clear with them. So the way to make things clear with them is to say, Hey, what happens if we do not agree? What happens if we break up? So an example of this might be, um, you know, uh, YouTube, when it started had three founders, it wasn't just Chad Hurley, and the other guy, 
there was a third one javid and um javid i think did like two years and then left famously and so he gave back half of his equity which i guess you could argue was a mistake in hindsight but you know whatever i mean he still got rich and that was most fair to them so this is part of uh basically doing a prenuptial agreement for startups make sure you have those conversations you have three co-founders okay what if one of us quits uh you know in year one what if we can't make a decision how do we do that okay there's three of us and there's two board members that's five we'll have three common seats we'll give one seat to the seed investors one seat to the series a investors there's five if three people want to do something that's the way we're going to go and the ceo is going to make the final decision and you're going to be ceo i'm going to be product officer you i'll default for business decisions to you i'll you'll default defer to me for product decisions you just have that discussion just like people who are going to get married might discuss like what if we want to leave the city and live in the country what if we want to have kids what if i don't know you know pick the myriad of issues you might face in a marriage or a partnership you really want to discuss those things up front and you'll go a lot further Peter Lang says, what does it feel like to be rich? What are your guilty luxury purchases? Hmm. I, you know, when I first uh, made a little bit of money, it was a major difference for me because I was scared of running out of money my whole life and felt that pressure. Uh, when I first made a little bit of money, it actually just made me more bold, took the edge off. And now I don't really think about it. Uh, I'll be totally honest. I don't really look at things all that often. I just focus on the process. And so I think in that way, it's freeing, it becomes a clarifying moment for you, you become what we call in the industry post money, a person who's post money is past that milestone of needing money. It's a really obnoxious thing, I guess, from the outside, somebody might clip this and be like, Oh, my God, post money. But it's kind of like being healthy, right? Like if you're healthy, and you can run the marathon, and you're your ideal weight, and you know, that's like one form of health. And then I think there's wealth, which is another form of health and uh, education, right? And relationships and mental health, all of those things, when you kind of check the box, it frees you to lower your anxiety about that issue. You know, and like, I'm anxious about my weight, like in the age of COVID, I'm like, I dropped the 20 pounds, I really need to get that other 10 pounds off. I'm 50 years old right now. So I'm actually working on that in my life. And you know what, no amount of money can solve that problem for me, I still have to solve that problem through my own uh you know discipline and 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 really working out and eating better which i'm trying to do so um but it does thing i think and you know i talk about wealth in the next book a whole lot and uh what i think it does is uh the pursuit of wealth i think is noble um uh, because it does allow you to make more change in the world so people who complain about wealth disparity the best thing they could do would be to start a business and then pay people a lot of money to work there. Like if you actually really care about wealth disparity, well, why not open a cafe and pay people amazingly, and give them health benefits? Well, you know what, some people have actually done that. That's a better way to make change in the world than to sit there on Twitter and, and you know, dunk on people or complain about Bezos, like, look at all the good Bezos is doing He created a lot of jobs, he's paying two or three times minimum wage. You know, you could come up with like, is he should anybody have that amount of wealth Well, somebody has to be the richest person in the world. And he gave 10 billion to climate change and his wife or his ex wife. I mean, amazingly, she is giving away money faster than it is accumulating. And so I do think that wealth and the pursuit of wealth can be noble, uh, depending on how you pursue it. Obviously, if you're pursuing a life of crime, no. And if you do it at the expense of other people, obviously, no, or the environment, obviously, no. But I do see that people who acquire wealth then are faced with a, a crisis of consciousness, where they look deeply and say, why am I on the planet? What am I here uniquely to do? And what can I do better than anybody else? And, and how can I pay it back? And I, I did think about that. And the way I thought I could pay it back was by doing this podcast every day and inspiring you to become a founder, right? Like I literally thought about that. And then I thought, well, how could I pay it back? I did so well, Angel. Investing. Well, I could start Angel University and the Angel podcast and write the book Angel. So I could teach people how to become angel investors. And there are now tens of 1000s of people who are angel investors because of me. How do I know that? Because they tell me and they joined my syndicate. When I started the syndicate.com it was 900 members, the book came out. And now it's at 9000 members. So it's literally 10 x in three years. And we're investing in, you know, some months, 10, 12 companies. And that feels really good to then pay it forward to pay it back to not pull the ladder up behind you, but rather steady the ladder. And that's what I'm doing. I'm basically I look behind me at that ladder that I climbed up. And I'm I'm holding it, I'm holding it nice and steady. And I'm giving you that encouragement to climb up that ladder. So start a company, 
build an MVP, learn how to be a product manager, go to founder.university. We're starting that as a 12 week program shortly, and you're going to be able to apply, we're gonna have 50 people in it, we're going to teach you how to build your MVP, and then how to get into an accelerator. So founder.university is coming. And that's going to be another, you know, steadying of the ladder that we're doing, we're throwing back 50 ladders down for founder university, we're literally going to charge this is my current plan for founder university. It's like a 12 16 week program. I think it's gonna be 12. We're going to charge people $700. I'm curious what you think of this. We're going to charge them $700. And then we're either going to give them their money back if they complete the 12 weeks, or, and I have to look into the legality of this, I was going to take the 700 times 50 people and invest 35,000 in the winner. Is that right? 700 would be 35,000. Which idea do you like better? If you were to come to Founder University for 12 weeks and learn how to be a founder and to take your idea, maybe using no code or coding and make your MVP and get your first couple of customers and we teach you how to get into an accelerator, that's going to be because we we realized that was a ladder that people needed. Which would you rather do get your $700 back at the end if you complete all 12 weeks, because I want people to have skin in the game and I don't need the 700 bucks or B, would you like me to or actually the way I could do it, that wouldn't be like gambling because I do think some people might consider that gambling. Um, I could personally just agree to invest 35k in the one who uh, comes in and so we take the profit of 35 k and we invest it somebody option uh, michael says option two fa says b michael says b no money back Iqbal says on youtube either sign me up well or, listen if you're interested in this founder.university and our charlie uh cuddy is uh, going to run the program i literally hired an educator to work with me and he's incredible i think he's charlie at launch.co so if you want to email charlie at launch.co and get a jump on that um, we haven't announced it officially yet. So I just thought I would float it here. But it's, uh, it's gonna be a pretty cool program. Um, it's gonna be 12 weeks, because I see everybody starting these programs and teaching people how to um, be founders. And I was like, well, I think I know a little bit about that. Uh, so my plan is to have 50 people come in and then success for me would be 10 of them 20% getting accepted to YC tech stars launch accelerator, uh, Daniel Gross's pioneer labs, something like that, right? I think that's a really cool idea. If you could get your MVP out, get a couple of customers, have some data and build a team, like those two or three things, and then be good enough to get the 100k check from an accelerator. That to me would be great success. Oh, thanks for reading the book, Angel. Yeah, if you haven't read Angel, uh, go ahead and read it. And you know, people always ask me, hey, what can you do? Uh, what can I do for you? If you really want to do me a favor, like, uh, there's really only a handful of things you can do. One is to read the book or listen to the audio book and then pass it on to a friend after you're done or, uh, or donate it to a library and then write a review. Uh, because when you write a review of uh, the book, it really helps. And then the second thing you could do that'd be really helpful is to write a review of this podcast uh, and subscribe and join the Noti Club. Um, I'm going to start doing live events again, by the way, uh, whenever this uh, is over. And my plan is to use these live streams to find folks. And one thing we're doing uh, that I forgot to talk about was we're going to start uh, twist meetups again. So the fans uh, of this podcast, we're going to let them self organize like TEDx and make I don't want to say your own business, but your own project um, where if three founders, a minimum of three, a maximum of seven will and you have to be a founder, not somebody selling into founder. So you know, I love real estate folks and accountants and lawyers and they sponsor the podcast and they support it. Uh, but I don't want them to be the organizers of this. I want founders organizing meetups for founders and the, it's founders for founders to come to the twist meetup. You have to be a fan of the show and a founder. Um, I guess we'll let other people in as well, but uh, free for founders. And yeah, you just get a cafe, you do breakfast, it could be five or 10 of you and just talk. And then we're going to make a notion page and Rachel is running that and she is Rachel at launch.co R A C H E L at launch.co if you want to do your city. Um, she's coordinating all of that on slack. So if you go to this week in startups.com slash slack or you email her, you can talk to her about it. But I think we're going to do New York, London and Austin first. Uh, so we're going to start with three cities, it's going to be a meetup and we're going to coordinate it with uh, notion and slack. So we're going to make a notion page uh, at this week in startups.com slash meetups. I don't know if that's up and running yet. If it's not, we should set it up this week in startups.com slash meetups. And, and you know, so then people said, what do you do at the meetup? I think I wanted to start the meetups with just like, 
you know, your first meetup, the goal would be to have 10 founders have breakfast or lunch or dinner together, and everybody pays their own way. And then after that, maybe go to 50 or up to 50. And then after that, maybe up to 100 or 200. And then you could start adding programming. So maybe we'll give people a pathway where if they do the first one, they take a picture, they share it. And they, you know, mission one, oh, that's a cool way to do it. Mission one is host a 10, you know, up to, you know, five to 10 people have breakfast. Mission two, uh, 25 to 50 people go have dim sum or pizza, uh, or go to a bar. And then mission three will be 50 to 100 people and you have programming for the first time. So if you do the first two, you get to actually host programming. And so mission one, you host an up to 10 person uh, breakfast or lunch uh, or dinner. Mission two, you have to complete mission two. Mission two is you host a 25 to 50 person uh, meetup where people just wear labels and it's a networking event. And then mission three, 50 to uh, 50 to 100 people and you do content and then you would earn the right to do content. And then I will probably call in to the content one and, you know, appear on a screen or something. So let, let's make mission one, two and three, Rachel. I think that's a good idea. Uh, so thanks, everybody. How about some places in Europe and Stockholm? Absolutely. Well, Stockholm, my friend, um, Tyler has his own meetup. So I wouldn't want to compete with that. So go to Tyler's. Or I guess if you want to have the breakfast, I don't think that competes with Tyler's, but just make sure you invite him and get his blessing. Um, okay. When will you have a cameo on billions? You know, I almost was on the uh, poker episode because Phil Hamill was on the poker episode. And uh, Brian Koppelman invited Phil to bring people from our poker game to play in that I think it was the first season and I couldn't make it. But my friend Billy and uh, uh, Phil were on that episode. And I've talked to Brian Koppelman about maybe doing a cameo on it at some point, but he had Chris Saka, so probably don't need to have me uh, on it. But boy, I would love to do a cameo in the Uber. So everybody clip this and send it to Brian. Give Jason a cameo as an Uber driver or an obnoxious Uber. Even better. Imagine me as an obnoxious Uber passenger who just, you know, yells and screams at the Uber driver. That would be <laughs> hilarious. Or I'm an Uber driver. Either of those would be. Uh, uh, what are your thoughts about Magic Leap? You know, I, I thought Magic Leap was a giant scam because it broke my rule, which is any startup that is worth over a billion dollars before they release their product or have customers is going to be a scam or it's going to fail massively, one of the two. And they they kind of fit in that. But I was told when I said that on a previous episode that I would be concerned it's a scam, uh, or my gut tells me my spidey sense, somebody told me, uh, and I won't say who but somebody who's an insider said, um, the new CEO, uh, I don't know the woman's name is the real deal, that the first product was kind of janky and, and not very good. And that the new product is really good. And that it's actually gonna surprise people how good it is. So I'm not gonna say how I know that but you can be sure that Sometimes we get inside information because <laughs> some of you might be involved with the companies we cover. And if you have information on the companies we cover, all right, everybody, uh, thoughts on TikTok, it should be banned in the United States. We are crazy to allow China, uh, our competitor uh, on the global stage, to have all this data. And they've proven that they're untrustworthy, that they're liars, and that they'll put people in jail with their information. They are proven to be untrustworthy. We should not allow them to have any apps or any products or services in the United States that collect data, just like they don't allow us to. So it should just be reciprocal. They're smart. We're stupid. A lot of our politicians are grifters who are in on the take. They're getting paid off by special interests who have interest in China uh, on both sides, Democratic, Republican. It doesn't matter what side you're on. These grifter politicians are selling out our kids. And I think that, honestly, it's uh, a bit of a psy psyops, I think. China is doing psyops on us. Okay, listen, I got to get back to work. So do y'all. Uh, great to have you here. I'll see you all tomorrow. Bye-bye.